Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today at the Europe Cloud Summit. Today, we're going to talk about identity and access management and how can software developers use that to do great cloud security. Let's get started. My name is Shira, and I'm the CEO of Solvo, an innovative cloud security startup. I have lots of passion about security and to promote women in this industry. Let's get started with our conference today. So we, we moved from the on-prem to the cloud. We no longer just deliver code and let the IT handle everything else. The software developers have so much responsibility today that they didn't have in the past. Think about it. We were given the power to provision any cloud asset, cloud asset or service that we want at any size, with any compute power anywhere in the world. In the cloud, we don't only deliver code, now we deliver a microservice or an application. Our entire architecture is API driven and there are a lot of decisions we have to make around it. Some are of course security related, where bare metal ends, our responsibilities begin. We are responsible for the security of our infrastructure Infrastructure, infrastructure, excuse me, as a part of our application. The cloud providers created a few security services and mechanisms for us, but today I'm going to have a drill down on a very specific one called IAM, Identity and Access Management. I decided to, specific, to speak specifically about it because it describes very well why cloud security is so different than the on-prem security. If in the past we did security in the network layer by filtering traffic per protocol or port, today we have much stronger tools to do security with. They do security in a very granular form, but we have to, do, to use them wisely as well. So let's get started and learn how to do that. Let's describe what is IAM first. This is a security mechanism that allows us to define and manage in a very granular manner, all the access to services and resources in our cloud account. We can give or deny access and require for certain conditions in order to approve an access or an action. Let's look at the building blocks of IAM. The IAM is built out of these components. First is a principle. Every action on an AWS resource can be performed by a principal. A principal can be a user or a role, but don't worry, I'm going to elaborate on these ones soon. Basically, uh, a role is a temporary credential. All principals need to be identified and authenticated with credentials. Credentials, uh, for example, can be a username and a password, like we all know and like to use, but in this case, we're talking about an ID, which is public, and a token, which of course is a secret. Next is a request. The principal's attempt to access any service is actually a request to AWS. The request has a specific action like a put or delete or get action, depends on what we wanted to achieve. Authorization. Um, the next thing that happens is checking and deciding if to allow or deny the request. In AWS by default, all requests are denied. Only the admin user is allowed to do everything, but I know that you already know better than that and you never use the admin user. So all requests are denied unless we specifically allow them. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Next is actions. Um, we can do different actions with different cloud resources like view an item, create an item, edit an item, delete an item, and so on. Last is resource. Um, that's where the action is going to be performed, on which resource it is going to be performed. And over here, we have an action or a policy that uh, uh, that, uh, that they took as an example. Uh, you can see we have an action and we have a resource. And in this example, we can see the asterisk. An asterisk is a wild card. It means that it gives access to any resource or to execute any action, depends on what we wanted to achieve here. In this specific case, as you can see, um, we can get access to 
any DynamoDB because we see an, a DynamoDB and then the asterisk. Also to any S3 bucket because we have the asterisk and uh, we can perform any action on them. All uh, possible actions on these two types of resources can be executed. This is a very, very bad practice and a very bad policy to use. I hope this is not the kind of policies that you're using in your organization right now. Uh, we are not done yet. We still have a few more components to talk about. Uh, first is the users. Uh, user can be a person, maybe a new developer that joined your team, maybe a new SRE. That's a user. We can give um, uh, specific permissions to specific users, to individuals. We can also group them. If you have a few users who have some common characteristics like all the developers or all the DevOps engineers, and they share the same privileges that they need, we can uh, divide them by groups and give permissions per group. Next is the policy. A policy is a set of permissions that controls the access to an AWS resource. It's the JSON file that we just saw in the previous slide, and it tells us specifically who can access to a resource and what action can they perform. So we can be very, very specific around that as well, and it's unnecessary to use the asterisks. Now is the role. It's the most interesting part, in my opinion. Remember we talked about uh, the API-driven architecture before? Well, that means that very often we need to connect to other third-party services in our infrastructure or application. We're going to need to give them access to our environment and send and receive some data from them. But does that mean we need to give them a username and a password to our AWS account? That sounds like a very serious headache to manage and a very serious security hustle. Uh, so the good thing is that we have the role which lets us create a temporary credential that can get assumed by an instance. At that time, a service and an action are limited. So we're giving someone or a service temporary credentials limited by time and limited by the action uh, they can do and limited by the service they can do the action with. So, if cloud security is so smart and advanced and we can be very specific around how we give permissions, who we give permissions to, and what actions can they execute, why do organizations keep on doing the same mistakes over and over again, exposing their user data and their own secrets? And by the way, they're paying tens of millions of dollars of fines every year. The answer, in my opinion, is that the process around creating granular and least privileged security configuration is not easy enough for the users to use. Look at the uh, policy creating screen, for example. I'm not going to run through, the, through each step of the process, but it's taking a few long moments to make us uh, take the decision and we're unsure around it. We're unsure how to specifically grant permissions and how to create this policy. So very often we just go ahead and uh, select all the check boxes and just try to move on with it as fast as possible. So obviously creating the policies ourselves is not a good idea. But AWS tried to create some policies for us. Uh, let's take a look uh, here, for example, um, we're looking at the read only from a DynamoDB. Now we assume that AWS, when they create policies, they will create them least privileged and secured, right? So wrong. Uh, over here, you can see just a fraction of the entire uh, read-only policy. But look at how many actions we have here that we can run uh, that we did not intend to run. All we wanted to do was to read from a DynamoDB. I decided to take a closer look into this kind of policy in the AWS policy simulator. Uh, this is a service that all of you can use in AWS. Uh, you can take your policy, put it here on the left side um, and see what kind of actions we can run. Uh, don't forget to check on the top bar against which services would you like to check this kind of policy. So I checked the read-only DynamoDB uh, that you just saw before, and I was very, very surprised to discover that in a read-only policy, 
we can run a lot of different actions and get lots of pieces of data that I don't think anyone intended to give. Uh, for example, we can list all the Lambda functions and all of their configurations. Uh, we can get all the roles and all the policies by using this read only DynamoDB. Uh, we can have a dry run, and that means uh, we can uh, check if we have the right permissions to make a specific action without actually executing it. So this is a very interesting feature and a very interesting piece of information for, for a malicious actor who wants to check what kind of actions they can do in our account. Uh, we can see all the security groups and everything related to network security and a lot of other pieces of information that I don't have time to talk about today. And all of this is coming out of a read only from DynamoDB policy. So obviously we did not intend for this to happen. Um, in an ideal world, how a policy is going to look like? Well, this is it. We can, as I said before, we, we can be very, very granular and very specific around what action did we want to take. For example, here you can see that in the DynamoDB, we are only allowing the get item action. Then we can also be very specific around the resources. We don't have to use the asterisks and give uh, access to all of our resources. In this example, we were very specific about which Dynamo, in which region, and which table specifically inside the DynamoDB did we want to get access, give access to. So you don't have to give access to the entire Dynamo or to all the Dynamos in your account. And same goes for any other cloud service that you're using in your account. You can be very specific about what action did you want to take and on which partition exactly in your cloud service did you want to do that. Um, so, what can we as cloud users can do uh, if we were giving so much responsibility or how can we do cloud security better now that we got all of this responsibility? So first of all, I think that it is our responsibility to learn more about cloud capabilities and mechanisms. The better we understand them, the more we can make out of them. But you already know that because you're attending the Europe Cloud Summit today. Second, security is everyone's job from the developer to the QA, to the DevOps and the security team. Don't wait for anyone to tell you that it's your job. Security starts at the design phase and happens throughout the entire CI CD process. Um, there are some free open source tools that you can use to improve your cloud security poster. And I highly recommend using them. I have a few examples here that I like using the most. But uh, obviously, you can use any type of tool that you wish to use. Uh, first one is in the pre-commit phase. Uh, you can use Talisman. It's a tool that is going to make, uh, make sure that your developers are not committing credentials and tokens. Uh, we all know how important that is and what kind of damage this can uh, create. Second one is the AWS Secret Manager. It's a very common bad practice to store credentials in the configuration files. Uh, and using secret managers can mitigate that risk of losing credentials. Um, OWASP dependency check, we can use that uh, on all of your open source and third party code and packages. Um, often these ones create a lot of vulnerabilities and we must check to make sure that uh, we don't run them and we should do these checks on a regular and automated basis. Uh, OWASP Zap is a dust that you can use for your web applications. Um, and Netflix are constantly releasing very, very cool open source tools. In this example, I'm talking about uh, the tools that do the permission adjustment. Uh, because if you want to make sure that your permissions are least privileged, you might want to reduce uh, the pieces uh, of, the, of the policy that you're not using. Now, I believe that starting security on the left side of the, of the software lifecycle is very important. I also think that it should be automated because not everyone on our team has enough knowledge as to how to do security the right way. That's why we came up with Solvo. Solvo is an adaptive platform that automates this process for you. On our website, you'll find the free version of the product so that you can start protecting your cloud environment today. 
don't be shy. Come visit us. Come to ask any question you might have. Thank you so much for being with me today and have a great conference.